Hi folks, I'm back. This week I'm going to be going over Esther chapter 9, but let me pray before I begin. Dear Father, Father, I just thank you for this time of opportunity. Father, I just thank you for letting me bring forth your word. Father, I just ask that you just give people receiving hearts and minds. I just ask that you let me decrease and you increase, Father. I just ask that you just give people up a fervency and a fire in their heart, Father, to study your word, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So before I begin chapter 9, let me go over uh, chapter 8. So in chapter 7, Haman's evil plot had been exposed by Esther. And as a result of this, Haman was hanged. And in chapter 8, all the property that once belonged to Haman was now turned over to Queen Esther and Mordecai because Haman raised his hands up not only against somebody who was Jewish, but he also raised his hands up against the, 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 uh, the king's wife, Queen Esther. So therefore, all of his property was forfeited and went to Mordecai and Esther. In chapter 8, the king grants Mordecai to write an edict that would allow the Jews to defend themselves when they're attacked by these hordes of people that Haman um, had given permission to in the third chapter when he wrote his edict granting uh, people in the 127 provinces of King Ahasuerus granting them permission to attack the Jewish people on a certain day. And remember, any edict, any law that was written in Meda Persia could not be revoked once it had been sealed with the king's signet ring. So when Mordecai uh, commands the scribes to write a second edict allowing the Jewish people to defend themselves against the hordes of individuals that are coming to destroy them, he's not revoking Haman's edict, he's just giving them permission to defend themselves. So once this second edict was written and sealed with the king's signet ring that Ahasuerus gave Mordecai, then it also became a law. So, a law. so on the day when so on so on the day when Haman's edict went into effect to destroy all the Jews Mordecai's edict also went into effect allowing the Jews to defend themselves so now we're in chapter 9 starting at verse 1 now in the 12th month that is the month of Adar on the 13th day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. That's the edict of Haman and the edict of King Yazawaris or the edict of Mordecai. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. And this has been true down through history. Anyone who's come against the Jewish nation has always been defeated. So ask yourself this question, why? Because God, like with us, has a plan and purpose for the nation of Israel. If Israel ceased to exist, if Israel had ceased to exist, 
before Jesus came the first time, where would he come to? Remember, it says in the book of John, chapter 1, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. So if Israel didn't exist at that time, where would Jesus have been born? The Bible already predicted he was going to be born in Bethlehem. That he was going to be raised in a city called Nazareth. And that he was going to do all these miracles and, and wonderful things. And then he was going to die on a cross. So if Israel didn't exist, how could that have happened? It, it wouldn't have. And that's true today too. If Israel's enemies could destroy Israel completely, then where would Jesus return to to set up his kingdom? There's 1,550 verses in the Old Testament that talk about Israel being replaced to a place of prominence and blessing and that Jesus will one day come back and set up his kingdom and rule and reign from uh, Mount Zion or Jerusalem, that's the other name. But if Israel did not exist, it wouldn't happen. And that's what the devil's trying to do. He's trying to destroy Israel in order to discredit the Bible. Let's go on, verse 2. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought to harm them. And no one could withstand them because of the fear, I'm sorry, because fear of them fell upon all the people and all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work help the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. What's well, like today, folks? You know, when Israel was reestablished as a, as a nation 72 years ago, they were attacked by five Arab nations wanting to destroy them. And what happened a year later? Who was running home with their tails between their legs? It was those five Arab nations. And then in 67, the same thing happened. Israel was attacked again. But who went home with their tails between their legs? Running home with their tails between their legs? It was the enemies of Israel that were running home with their enemies, with their tails between their legs. And then the same thing in 73 during the Yom Kippur War. Now Israel was almost defeated there. But they weren't. You know, God turned things around and miraculously the nation was saved again. Because God has a plan and purpose for the nation of Israel. And no matter how many times their enemies come against them, they're always defeated. Now they'll never win, ever. Oh, and so for all these people that are preaching a replacement theology that God has done away with Israel and replaced her with the church, and now Israel no longer has a place in God's prophetic program, well, open your blind eyes. Why does Israel exist today if God didn't want them there? The simple truth is, is God's never replaced Israel with anyone or anything, and he, and he never will. Verse 5, Thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter, with, and with destruction and did what they pleased with those who hated them. See, you, you can't defeat Israel. You know, that's why it's better to be a blessing to Israel 
and, and not a curse. Because if you're a curse to Israel, well then God is not obligated to be a blessing to you. You'll never get anywhere. All this anti-Semitism, all this anti-Zionism that's going on in the world today, you think God is pleased with that? Do you think those people are going to prosper that hate Israel like that? No, they're not. Because that I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Covenant found in Genesis 12, 3 has never been revoked. It is not null and void just because it's in the Old Testament. All right, let's go on. And in Shushan the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Also, now listen, they give the names of Haman's 10 sons, but uh, unfortunately, I don't know how to say all these names, so I'm just going to skip down. I'm going to just skip down to verse 10. And it says, starting at verse 7, also, and then going down to 10, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. Haman is always referred to as the enemy of the Jews. They killed, but they did not lay their hand on the plunder. Now, I'm not sure why. I mean, they had every right to take whatever their enemies brought with them, but they didn't. Probably why is because this was not about, well, I'm just, I'm just going to plunder these people and, and, and be happy. No, what? It was about just defending myself against those that, were, that are trying to destroy me. That's probably why they didn't lay their hands on the plunder because it wasn't about taking what belonged to my enemies. It was only just about defending myself against being annihilated um, from these people that want to destroy me. Uh, verse 11, on that day the number of those who were killed in Shushan the citadel was brought to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan the citadel and the ten sons of Haman. Now they've already killed Haman's ten sons, but something's going to happen here that, well, I'll explain when we get there. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. He asked his wife this question at least two other times before this maybe three but notice notice what esther says see esther's not after wealth she's not after fame she just wants to see justice done here verse 13 then esther said if it pleases the king let it be granted to the jews who are in shushan to do again tomorrow, in other words, defend themselves against their enemies according to today's decree and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. Now, if Haman's ten sons were already dead, why would they have to hang them up on the gallows? As a warning. They, their dead bodies were hung up on the gallows as a warning to others, saying, this is what's going to happen to you if you come after these people in the Jewish community. The same is going to happen to you. So it was a warning. Okay, let's go on. So the king commanded this to be done the decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan 
but they did not lay their hand on the plunder because it wasn't about um, plundering my enemy's wealth. It was simply only to defend myself and to kill those that were trying to kill me. But I wasn't going to get rich off of their wealth because their wealth didn't mean anything to me. All that mattered to these people that were defending themselves was their life. That's all they wanted. They wanted their life back and not to be taken by their enemies. 16. The remainder of the Jews in the king's province gathered together and protected their lives. See, it's about protecting, it's all about protecting their lives had rest from their enemies and killed 75,000 of their enemies. But they did not lay a hand on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. And on the 14th day of the month they rested, made it a day of feasting and gladness. So it was all about just protecting myself and defending myself against these people that wanted to, to kill me. It wasn't about taking their riches, their wealth, or whatever it is they brought with them. It had nothing to do with that. It was all just about defending themselves. 18. But the Jews who were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day as well as on the 14th day and on the 15th of the month they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages who dwelt in unwalled towns celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. By the way, they still do this in modern day Israel. I'm not sure if they do it in other countries, but I know in modern day Israel, they still do this. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far who were in the provinces of the king uh, of uh, in the provinces of King Ahasuerus to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies as the month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them and from mourning to holiday that they should make them days of feasting and joy of sending presents to one, one another and gifts to the poor. Well, perhaps they, I know they, I know Jews all over the world celebrate Parem every year. So perhaps they do send gifts one to the other in other countries. But I, I know for a fact they, they do it in Israel. So the poor Jews, I mean, so the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun as Mordecai had written to them because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, again, here we go, the enemy of the Jews. Remember, every time his name is mentioned, that's how he's mentioned. The enemy of the Jews had plotted, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them and had, and had cast purr, that is the lot, to consume them and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot, which Haman had devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, which it did, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows, which they were. Twenty-six. So they call these days Purim, something they celebrate every year. 
after the name Pur. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the, pres the prescribed time that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed amongst the Jews, and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. So like I said, every year, Jews throughout the world celebrate Purim, remembering as a day when they were delivered from Haman and those that wanted to kill them, according to Haman's edict. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them and as they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of their fasting and lamenting. So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim and it was written in a book. So what can we learn here from all of this? That it's pointless, 100% pointless for you, for any of us, to be against the Jews because you will not prosper. All right, if you hate the Jews, that you are an enemy of God. Because God, nowhere in his Bible does God say to hate the Jewish people or the Jewish nation. So if you are not being a blessing to the nation of Israel, that means you are being a curse, just like Haman was here. And look at what happened to him. He ended up being hung on a gallows. I'm not saying that's going to happen to you. But you know what? Somewhere, some, sometime, somewhere down the line, if you hate the Jews, God, God is going to stop you somewhere, somehow. I don't know how, and I don't know where, but he, he will stop you. And the book of Esther is proof positive of that, that God doesn't let anti-Semitism just go on forever and forever and forever. He stopped Hitler eventually, right? Hitler's, Hitler's thousand year Reich only lasted 12 years. He and his wife, Eva Braun, Ended up committing suicide, supposedly. I, there's, been, there's been a lot of controversy about that. But for the sake of the argument, let's just say him and his newly, wed, newly wedded wife ended up committing suicide in the Fuhrer bunker located beneath the Reich Chancellery. And you know, Hitler's last will and testament he still, in his last will and testament, blamed the Jews for everything. Yeah, Hitler, Hitler, Hitler was very misguided. He honestly thought that the Jews of Europe were Europe's misfortune. And that if he could just get rid of these people, then 
everything would be all right in Europe. All their problems would be solved. Well, I'm sorry, folks. But all of us are sinners. We've all contributed to the misfortune of this world. And today, unfortunately, that mindless type of thinking still persists. You have these 20 Arab nations that are trying to destroy Israel, thinking the same thing that Hitler thought. If we just get rid of these people, peace will come to the Middle East and all of our problems will be solved. But the simple truth of the matter is, is that there has never been peace in the Middle East, even when Israel was not a nation. There was no peace in the Middle East. So don't tell me that if we get rid of one group of people, that it's going to bring peace to the Middle East, because it won't. And a lot of Jewish people are caught up in this nonsense. And one of those people, um, he's a very well-known politician. I can't say his name, but he's a very well-known politician. And he believes this nonsense, and he sides with Israel's enemies. Well, as a matter of fact, it's two well-known politicians, okay, that side with Israel's enemies and actually give them money. And when you do that, you are not being a blessing to Israel. Believe me, somewhere, sometime, God is going to put the brakes on your anti-Semitic attitude, just like he did with Haman here, and put an end to your nefarious plans, just like he did with Haman and Hitler. So folks, Next week, I'm going to wrap it up with chapter 10. But um, until then, my name is Dave Martin. <clears throat> God bless you. Shalom. And remember, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122.6.